friends, and welcome to Tim Kirby Russia. I'm Tim Kirby, political analyst and radio talk show host, an American who's lived in Russia for about 15 years now, who's one of the few people who actually knows how the society works, how the civilization flows, and how to say those things in English. Today's episode, friends, is going to get spicy because our topic is a hot one, feminism in Russia and how it's different from the West. Our guest for the big interview today is Daria Platonova, who has a PhD from Moscow State University. She's a political observer and specialist in Neoplatonism, as well as a researcher in Orthodox feminism. But we'll get to that a little bit later. Okay, so before our big discussion about feminism in Russia, I'd like to jump back in time a little bit to medieval times. Not to talk about women's issues or anything like that, uh, but to uh, make a point. So if we look across the uh, medieval world, it wasn't just Europe. Uh, the uh, sort of uh, India, Middle East, Russia, China, Japan, really sort of all had this medieval period with some kind of uh, lords overseeing uh, serfs or vassals of some sort, uh, being ruled by monarchs, a very highly religious society. So this sort of diverse looking on the surface but deeply homogenous uh, medieval world has kind of come back uh, because today, with pretty much no exception, the world has really gone through modernity. The world has pushed through the Industrial Revolution and only maybe some of the last most stringent uh, holdouts uh, like Saudi Arabia uh, really look like the world did before the Industrial Revolution. And so we can see there's a real big tie between uh, industrial and uh, economic development and so-called women's liberalization uh, because it would seem that there's a paradox between an industrial economy or post-industrial economy and the idea that the overwhelming majority of women do not work and they stay at home as moms, have large numbers of children who are supposed to help out with the family. It seems like these things are in direct contrast. So no matter what people try to get to about the morality of feminism and all this, that, and the other, it seems like it was it's really just a consequence in the shift of the way the economy works. And that's very important because we are on the doorstep of what they're writing as the big old great reset. I'm sure you've heard about that. It sounds delightfully scary, but it could actually be an opportunity for an interesting victory for women across the globe. Now, one of the sort of justifications of why women had to enter the workforce was World War II, right? There weren't enough men, and so women were asked to go to the factories and uh, work as best they could and to help out with the war effort. And supposedly, the uh, mythology goes that then women were very excited in the West and they wanted to work and they blew open the doors of these stereotypes and things were changed forever. But I think it was had to do a lot more with the fact that uh, large corporations really at the time saw it that half the workforce, in fact, slightly more than half the workforce wasn't really working and that they could get a lot more out of people and a lot more out of society. But now the Great Reset tells us that people aren't really needed. The jobs are going to vanish and that everything is going to clamp down and it's going to become a very uh, brutally divided world between some sort of creative super class and then people have to work with their hands doing things that robots can't do with their robotic hands. Now that sort of begs the question is Okay, if we're going back to a world where we need less people, why can't we go back to a world with families? Why can't we go back to a world where being a stay-at-home mom to produce these uh, highly educated, highly creative children uh, is an option? Because as we see today, with the, basically the death of motherhood, we can see the effect on society. We can see the dumbing down of society. We can see the bad and misguided behavior of children. Uh, you know, a quarter of the narcotics consumed all over the world are consumed in America and the West in general. We are miserable and defeated. Our families are shattered. And so in some ways, we look at this great reset as the maybe uh, um, sort of like a Terminator style situation where the robots are coming to uh, take our jobs and replace us. But it doesn't have to be. This could be the new opportunity where we really put the focus on the family, where mom stays home, she educates the kids, because the kids have to be as absolutely smart as they can to compete with uh, the automation that they promise is coming. So in a lot of ways, we're at the dawn of maybe the return of the best of the old school world, where women were protected, taken care of, they were 
it's definitely pushed to have children, uh, to have families and find the love of their life and all that, but at the same time have an extremely important, vital role in society and maybe even work from home because the technology that's allowing us to uh, survive a certain disease uh, has uh, basically opened the doors for a lot of women to have motherhood but with the opportunity for a little bit of work on the side not having to choose between work and family but kind of a mix of both and so we're at the cusp of this uh, very interesting opportunity and definitely at the forefront of this new opportunity is Russia. So if we exclude the ultra-liberal freak show of downtown Moscow, overall Russian society wants to have babies. The government wants people to have babies. The populace does. People want to have families. This is considered normal. It's also normal for men and women to say that they need each other because they do. Uh, Russia is not so much of an individualistic society and individualism can be good. Individualism means you're not acting like an adult baby on the one hand, but on the other hand, individualism can be very narcissistic because we can't admit that we need other people people. So that's one thing that's sort of good about the balance in Russian society. And with all the government programs that are trying to promote people to have families and have children's, children, so with all the government programs that are out there to get people to have children and feel good about having families and stay together and also having universal, fair, hard divorce laws, Russia's really ahead of the game in terms of uh, where uh, male and female relationships are going in the 21st century. So if anywhere is going to have a more uh, happier, nicer, kinder, family-friendly uh, Great Reset, it's going to be here in Russia. Because if we go back in time, we cannot forget that in the 1920s, during the Russian Revolution, there were all sorts of bizarre, freakish sort of uh, movements coming up from the woodworks of transvestites wanting to parade on Red Square and uh, the uh, down with shame movements, which were ultimately rejected by Russian society. Later on during World War II, unlike women in the West, when uh, women were forced to participate in the uh, man's world due to a very large percent of the male population being killed off, they found themselves in mines, ammunition factories, in the dirt and danger uh, that men have to deal with uh, at many jobs that women do not like. You know, it's become almost like an internet cliche that when women, uh, usually feminists, talk about the desire to have you know equal numbers of men and women in the workplace, they're talking about scientists and doctors and these sort of white collar high end professions. They're not talking about mine shafts, being an infantryman or anything like that, you know what I mean? So we have to look back to World War II and Russian women were shoved into this brutal masculine role of digging ditches and mines and all this other awful dangerous work and they did not like it. This was a different type of entering the male realm and overall Russian women rejected it. They do not want to uh, pick up shovels and uh, sling dirt all day. That's for us to do in the freezing cold, right? So that was another moment. Another moment that happened was we cannot forget that Russian women experienced uh, an apocalypse in the 1990s. The 90s, I cannot explain to you in words how horrible the 1990s were for Russian society. In fact, many people even believe that statistically the deaths caused by the collapse of the Soviet Union were equal to, if not worse, than the horrors of World War II. And women had to suffer through all of that. And you know what made that suffering a lot better? Being attached to a guy who could at least try as hard, given the, given the absolute worst situations possible to somehow provide for her and take care of her kids. That was just a little while ago and it's very fresh in the minds of women. So that's probably some of the reasons why Russian society has a very different attitude towards feminism. The uh, triumph for feminism found in the West in World War II was definitely not a triumph here and the West has yet to, but just may in the near future, experience the horrors of the 1990s where humans who were uh, previously living in one of the great superpowers were forced to fight to scrap on the streets for survival. And when it comes to fighting for survival, it helps to have muscle mass. <laughs>is really in Russia's hands to sort of show us what the family is going to look like. What are relations between men and women going to look like in the 21st century? Will Russia take that opportunity or just squander it? Well, we'll see. But what we can do is take a listen to Daria Platonova, who is a researcher of Orthodox feminism with a PhD from Moscow State University. She's going to tell us all about the true nature of feminism in Russia, starting right now.
Ms. Platonova, so roughly speaking, let's start this off. What are some of these key differences between feminism in Russia and the West? Yes, I've seen uh, the huge differences because it depends on the context uh, mm. of uh, where I have been in the West. There is a kind of process of um, secularization and the religion is mm. very, very moved far away from the state. So the problems of the feminism yeah. are not at all connected with any religious topics. It's important to note that Russia does not practice separation of church and state, but symbiosis of church and state, where the entities remain separate, but work together very often. That's an important nuance and one big difference between Russia and, say, America. Well, in Russia we have a very interesting phenomenon mm -hmm. where the context, the orthodox uh, context, mm -hmm. uh, somehow influences the, even the feminism. That means that uh, all the topics which are um, broadly described in the Western feminism, the, uh, like uh, the war for equality, mm -hmm. the war for rights, yeah. in Russia has the other degree. Because Russia is more traditional, uh, stays more traditional, and the influence of the orthodox religion is much um, more uh, complicated and interesting. So uh, here uh, we have a very interesting phenomenon mm -hmm. in the Russian feminism which appeared with the name of Tatiana Gorichova and oh. is called the Christian feminism. Tatiana Gorichova at the age of 26 during the height of the Cold War and communism in Russia converted to Eastern Orthodoxy. She later founded the idea of Orthodox feminism and had to survive as a dissident in the 80s in the West. When the opportunity to come home uh, arose in the 1990s, she came right back and is here to this very day. But unfortunately, there is very little, if anything, written about her in English, as are all good things that come from Russia. So I think it's unbelievable. Um, it's very, very interesting to, um, to um, say about this, speak about this in the West because nobody can understand how the religion, which according to the Western feminism is a way of installing the domination on women, can be connected, a feminine uh, religion can be connected with feminism, like it's two opposite sides and controversial concepts. That's interesting. Because in the West, it seems almost natural that femininity and Christianity are always at odds. But does this really have to be the case? Maybe they can actually work together and find some sort of middle ground. Actually, uh, Tatiana Gorishiva herself notes that uh, um, in uh, Christianity there are no uh, hierarchical type hierarchy of uh, woman and man, mm -hmm. and there is more dialogue between them. As uh, she quotes uh, Bible and she says that there was the Virgin Mary, yeah. a really uh, woman prototype, and there was a Christ, and there was no hierarchy between them. Mm -hmm. She gave born to him. She she, uh, she, it is um, the, his, uh, her son, and uh, there were no um, unequality in this balance. There was a balance. There was two worlds: the mm -hmm. world of woman and the world of man. Uh, then Tatiana Gorichev would do the anal uh, analysis, uh, the um, biographies of saints and yeah. saint women, saints, women, uh -huh. and she finds that there were a lot of. Um, woman saints uh, who had uh, um, overcome a big, uh, a huge uh, root of um, um, of great uh, existential war mm -hmm. and that they are like uh, really uh, similar to the way which was um, uh, taken and uh, overcome by uh, the men saints. So she says that there is a special role in the Christian orthodoxy about the woman's uh, uh, stradania, their suffering, sufferance, sufferance. and mm -hmm. she notes that um, that there can be not only one world, uh, world like man's world and the woman as a reduction of this world, but there are two worlds. And here's the key point. When Western society moved from monarchy to liberalism, who got their rights first? White, landowning men. They were the political actors and everyone else was a non-actor, you know, kind of like how uh, minors don't really have any responsibility today, or worse in the case of slavery. But as time went on, other types of men, other ethnicities and non-landowning men were all sort of grouped into this male category as the big political actor in society. Now, the interesting thing that happened was when women also wanted to be reflected by you know, the law, by constitution, rather than having sort of a separate entity, a separate uh, nature for women, women 
were shoved into the male category. So the interesting thing is when women did get their rights, they didn't get their rights by raising women from the status of non-entity to a separate woman entity of equal value to men, but they essentially became men. That is probably where feminism took a very wrong turn and why there's so much desire among awful feminists today to essentially replace men, take the place of men, or just become men. So is this key oversight in the logic of... But then again, that was a long time ago, about 100 years ago. Maybe this key oversight in the concept of feminism really isn't relevant today. Or is it? Well, Simone de Beauvoir says that uh, a woman is another. An other, uh, is, is an other. She is an other, the figure of another. Yeah. And this another is created by a man's world. And now a woman has to do a revolution against this man world. Mm -hmm. It's Simone de Beauvoir, de Beauvoir uh, the um, second way of feminism, so called in, historic, in history, second mm -hmm. wave of uh, feminism. But Tatiana Gorichiva notes that uh, it is fantastic that the woman is an other, but she is not another created by a man. She is another created by the God. Uh -huh. And so here she, she, she points out that this other has uh, a separate and other world mm -hmm. and there is no possibility to do uh, an hierarchical type of um, uh, hierarchization between the men's and the women's mm -hmm. and these worlds are different. Yeah. Here Tatiana Gorachev says that it can be based um, on the religion of uh, Christianity that uh, when it comes to God the man and the woman are equal mm -hmm. but they are not equal as the woman has all the rights the man has or the man is not equal to woman and he doesn't have the similar rights that woman has mm -hmm. this has two worlds yeah. and they doesn't correspond they doesn't cross they are two uh, separate worlds Men and women being of equal value but completely different natures is ironically a pretty radical version of feminism for today's Western society. This idea was um, was existing not only in the uh, Christian feminism but it was also um, created and presented in the standpoint feminism where mm -hmm. there is also the declaration. It's not connected with religion. It is widely presented yeah. mm -hmm. in the West but here we have the main topic that uh, woman's uh, world has nothing with men's world. This is very paradoxical thing because we think, yeah, the, the idea is quite obvious, really, they are different yeah. even from the consciousness, psychology, evil, physical appearance, were mm -hmm. different. But the problem is that the liberal feminism and the feminism which uh, dominates the West, it's focused on the creating the equality of women and men, mm -hmm. even till the uh, era of having the same psychological and physical appearance, yeah. like the androgyne uh, figure is some kind of making the real equality uh, of women and men becoming true. The current trend of androgyny, while forcing men to be sort of wishy-washy and passive, while praising women who are strong bosses, has really confused Western society. It's kind of like we're all square pegs being forced into round holes. Why should we do this? And why is this not happening in Russia, which is open to all the big, cool trends in Hollywood movies? Why does Russia have some sort of weird immunity to this? Well, for us, that's a very interesting case because when we watch how the feminism was developing in the world, we see that in Russia, the woman's suffrage was uh, accepted in uh, 1906, so in the beginning yeah, yeah. Uh, of the 20th century. Yeah. While in France, we have it uh, from 1944. Uh -huh. This is an incredible situation. That means that we have already uh, lived in the feminist world and now we mm -hmm. go to the new strategy of this Christian feminism, Orthodox feminism. Yeah. And uh, uh, as for as for uh, Russia of uh, today, contemporary Russia, I think we're still uh, trying to copy the West. We mm -hmm. try still to we still try to be uh, as liberal as the West is, even if uh, we have a little bit the course in the geopolitics to the multipolarity. But still, we are in this world where there is the man's domination mm -hmm. and the woman is some kind of other, mm -hmm. other created by a man. Yeah. So. I don't think that we have already overcome this uh, liberal feminism in Russia. I just think we still are in a trap of that. We still exist in the liberal paradigm, which uh, also, well, uh, 
it is a liberal paradigm but we don't uh, we need to always um, understand that russia was in the avant-garde of the feminist battle Mm -hmm. And like uh, today, we have a regress to to this liberalism. So we had a very Soviet avant-garde cyber, like cyber even feminism, the mm -hmm. idea of real resistance uh, of uh, women against the bourgeois liberal landlord um, totalitarian hegemony. Yeah. And now we are somehow softening our discourse to the liberal model, which is a regress. And mm -hmm. at the same time, uh, on the um, on the same way. On the, on the same on the same time we have uh, this Christian feminism which appears. But so why did Russian women themselves, not under coercion, willfully choose to reject feminism? Yeah, um, well, actually, actually, I think that's because of the context we are more classical and maybe here a uh, woman decided to be some kind of um, savers of uh, the patriarchy. Maybe mm -hmm. they started to feel that the men are losing a bit the will and mm -hmm. they started decided to be the patriarchal, um, how to say, savers. Maybe this is the um, explanation. At the same time, um, the thing is that uh, Russia was uh, communist more in the geopolitical way mm -hmm. and I'm not sure that we can say that cultural we have this cultural Marxism mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the West is now suffering from not from the communism as far as I'm analyzing the uh, conservative media in the United States I see a mm -hmm. lot of anti-communist um, uh, anti-communist uh, uh, speeches but these are not anti-communist but more anti-cultural Marxism mm -hmm. so we had the communism which was mainly um, the, the mainly the economical uh, economical direction of the communist socialism mm -hmm. but this um, uh, communist uh, politics we didn't have it a lot we didn't have this focus on the feminism mm -hmm. on the rights of uh, uh, LGBTQ and all what is happening now in the West so our communism was really different interesting but then why does Russia a formerly Marxist nation seem to be immune to the effects of cultural Marxism. So uh, the thing is that our mentality um, uh, does, didn't accept the communism as it was in the West, so mm -hmm. we did a small re-editing re of that. Um, the thing is that uh, for now, for Russians, it's quite uh, interesting to see uh, the cyborg feminists, which uh, uh, can exist in the communist parties, and mm -hmm. they are for the destruction of the woman, while we doesn't uh, see the communism as the destruction of the woman. In closing, are there any key differences between the mentalities of today's Western and Russian women and their desires, hopes, dreams, and political views? I do think we don't have this uh, real obsession of fighting men, and mm. uh, I think that we um, we like uh, the dialogue between harmony between men and women. Mm -hmm. We think that uh, when the guy is uh, helping you, I don't know, in the street, yeah. um, with uh, ha handing something, I don't know, maybe a big uh, suitcase, yeah, yeah. that is not a kind of uh, their domination on us. That's a kind of help, and this is normal. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that means that uh, a person helps us in this way and we uh, help men the other way yeah. we create we mm, i don't know if it's a family then we create the psychological balance we help with our mm -hmm. uh, uh, kitchen magic you know that there exists often <laughs> that it is a magic a kind of magic yeah. you can find uh, even the books now in the west where it's written the you know garden witch or kitchen witch it's oh, like a, yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. like even a, the witch is called uh -huh. the witch so we're helping in all the series and i think in russia this idea of the dialogue between uh two um, uh, women and men is very very widely um widely um Accepted. Accepted, yes. Yeah. While in the West, uh, the man and the woman dialogue it causes a problem. Mm -hmm. So, because the woman in the West has already uh, the problem that they can be dominated by men, they will be dominated uh, by men, and they have this small seam in their head, and they uh, doesn't create a dialogue, but a war. Okay, I would like to thank Daria Platonova for giving us this fantastic interview from a definitely different perspective than I'm used to. So anyways, guys, uh, in the future, we're going to have Daria's interview in uh, full. We're going to have an unedited version coming out very soon, which you should enjoy. 
enjoy. And I'd like to ask you to do the whole like, share, subscribe thing. But the key thing is really share. Guys, big tech is against us. The kind of things we're talking about in this program, they are not the kind of things big tech likes. So you're going to have to do it old school manual. Share this program with your friends. I'd really appreciate it. And if you want to do an interview with me, I'm always happy to. Let's have a chit chat. Anyways, see you in the next episode. Let's see you down here. Thank <laughs> you.